Welcome to the Line One Communications Conferencing Service. You may enter your participant or moderator PIN code followed by the pound key at any time during this introduction message. Once you have entered the conference, you can press star one. After the tone, please say your name. Police Boyer. The following participant has entered the conference. Dan Seeger. Hello, Walt. This is Dan. How are you today? I'm okay. How are you? Well, I'm doing all right. I, um, I've got a, a cancer on top of my head. I'm going to have to remove oh, it this gosh. week. Then. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Is it a skin cancer? The following participants yeah. have entered the conference. Jane Hurley. Yeah. Welcome, Jean. This is Dan. Hi, uh, Dan. In addition to Walt and Jean, is there anyone else on the call? Yes. Yeah, Ruth is here. Ruth, hi. Ruth, welcome. Do I hear Judy? Yes, I'm here. And is there anyone else? Jack Matheson. Hi, Jack. This is Dan. Welcome, Jack. Jack coming. Hi, Jack. Welcome. I have a regret from Marlene Varner. Uh, I am expecting Bob Nicholson to be with us uh, for the first hour. I'm thinking perhaps the call could be completed in an hour, but in any case, he can participate for the first hour. Yeah, and I'm going to have to ring off at about quarter past two if we're not finished, because I have a dental appointment. Okay, Ruth. We'll keep that in mind. Thank you. We're waiting for Pete Straub and for Bob Nicholson. I've got down six names, and I'm showing seven people on call. Or is, let's see, I've got Walt Boyer, Dan Seeger, Ruth Walsh, Judy, uh, um, Jean Gene Hurley. Hurley, Gene Hurley, Jack uh, Matheson, Matheson, Jack C. I guess, is Judy Moss on the call? Yeah. Yes. Yes. yes, Judy. Yes. Okay, good. Hi, Bob. This is Dan. Uh, we're uh, all we're all here, except we're still waiting for um, who are we waiting for? Peter. Uh, Peter Strauss. He's been going through some difficult times lately, so uh, if he may he may just it may just slip his mind. I don't know. Okay. Well, um, it is, according to my uh, clock, three minutes after the appointed hour. Perhaps we should begin and hope that he will join us. Yes. Um, friends, uh, just uh, for the formality, if you don't mind, we'll go through the uh, roll call again uh, to be sure we have a quorum. Uh, so I will call your name, and if you will just say you're here, that will be great. Walt Boyer? Here. Jack Cumming? Here. Gene Hurley? Here. Judy Moss? Here. Robert Nicholson? Right here. Dan Seeger, I'm here. Pete Straub? Pete is, we're waiting for Pete. Marlene Varner has sent regrets. And Ruth Walsh? Yep, I'm here. Thank you very much, friend. Jack Matheson? Uh, I'm Jack. Uh, I'm sorry I should have uh, mentioned uh, you. Uh, welcome, Jack. Um, the um, uh, the agenda has been circulated. I do have one item to add at the very end if we have time, and that's that I've been uh, getting carbon copies of a very interesting uh, dialogue uh, among um, uh, uh, a few of our um, supporters and, and board members who are concerned with financial issues having to do with impending changes in FASB regulations. And if we have time uh, at the end of the meeting, I'd like to invite Jack Cumming to just brief us for five or ten minutes, uh, not in the great detail, some of which is very technical, but just about the general import of this conversation and these impending changes. So if that's agreeable, I'll add that to the end of the agenda in the event we have time. That's fine. Great. Um, now, you've all received the minutes of December 3rd, 2014, and uh, Jack, there was just one, that, uh, as far as I recall, there was just one suggested change, which is that the 
uh, one of the one of the resolutions be included in its entirety in the minutes, which you have done already. So I believe there are no further corrections to the minutes. Um, I'm wondering if there's a motion that we accept. Welcome, Pete. This is Dan. Uh, Pete, we're glad you're here. We've just begun, and we're about to ask for a motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting. <laughs> Bob Nicholson just offered it as he came on. Okay, Bob. Uh, Bob has offered a motion. Is there a second? Second. Well, boy, your second. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, I heard two seconds, but Walt Boyer mentions his name, so we'll say Walt Boyer seconded the m m motion. Is there any uh, discussion or any objections? Uh, can I ask for approval of the minutes? Every, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, the minutes are approved. Thank you very much, friends. Uh, regarding the plans for the March uh, annual meeting, uh, there are... Uh, two things to add to the agenda that I've uh, indicated under item three. I think we want to just mention, uh, perhaps not in great detail, but mention the matter of food. And then um, we have the matter of um, re uh, possible resource persons and a possible addition to the uh, March public meeting or March general membership meeting of uh, uh, a membership report which uh, Bob proposed in an email this morning. But let's start at the beginning. Uh, the one thing I don't think we've discussed, and where maybe Pete can give us some little clue, is the matter of transportation to Greenspring from the airport. Pete, do you have any idea about how that can happen? Which airport? Well, that's the first question. Uh, National or Dulles or BWI? Uh, the second question is, um, if everybody came in at the same time, uh, then we could possibly arrange for a bus or something. But because people will be coming in at different intervals, uh, I have no clue as to how to do it. My guess is uh, um, just decide whether you're going to stay in a motel or what and um, see if you can't get a cab to that motel. Which airline right. would you suggest if you were coming into Spring, where where you live? Which airport would you use? Um, National and um, Dulles are about the same distance apart. I think. Um, BWI would, that is not the right one. Yeah, all right. National or Dulles? If you had a brother, which one? Yeah, National is probably a little bit closer, and you. Um, I don't know if you could use a. Uh, the the, uh, the metro. You get off the national metro, and, and yeah. you get the metro. Yeah, and go down to Springfield, and and uh, then it's only about a mile to to. Uh, it was the about metro, a mile to Greenspring, and and the same for the uh, motels and so on. Yeah. So the metro, the metro actually goes within a mile of Greenspring. That's yes. Fabulous. That's fabulous. Yes. So, so it sounds like uh, if if people could get flights to National, that's definitely to be preferred. Yeah. The only problem with National is that they have a, um, I don't know whether it's called what what kind of a law it is, but uh, uh, if you're going to fly from further than uh, 900 miles, then there has to be a stop in there. Um, it's not a big deal. For example, if you're leaving from Dallas, uh, you have to. You'll probably stop in Nashville or somewhere, and then come on in. Also, yeah. I see. Interesting. Uh, Dan, uh, I'd like to make a motion that we ask Pete to do a transportation memo and explain that, and explain that National is near Metro. How you board Metro? Where you board Metro? Where you get out of, of Metro? And if there's a public bus from the metro stop near Green Spring to a Green Spring, so we've got it all in writing and what it costs. Good. Well, uh, I can. Uh, Pete, are you I can do that? that. It shouldn't be a problem. That's great. That's great. That's great if you would do that. We hate to lay that job on you, but uh, it's, if you could do that, that would really be great. I'm assuming that this is mostly for the benefit of board members. I'm assuming that the sort of general members who show up on Sunday will be using some kind of vehicular transportation, maybe buses from their community or cars. 
there may be a few people coming from far enough away to fly, but I'm assuming they will not be very many um, if past uh, experience is any indication. But that's what, really what, great. What's the time that we should come in, that we should be in a... Well, from the for the board for, that for the board members for board members yeah. we we want to meet on Saturday yeah. as a, uh, and the general membership meeting is meeting on Sunday and and again the, the more time we have together in my view the so better. What time do we need to be there? Well, uh, suppose we say two o'clock in the afternoon. All right. And assume there'll be an afternoon and an evening session. All right. Now, okay. if you want to have some kind of a brunch uh, oh, beforehand, I can arrange that. But, you know, you just need to let me know and um, probably start that at 1 o'clock if that's what you want. Good. So why don't we say that um, uh, people will will look up their will, – will organize their transportation, and once they know whether or not they can be there by 1 – one. We will take account so that Pete knows how many people will be there for a lunch at one, and we'll plan to begin the business meeting at two. That sounds great. Okay. Uh, um, the only you know, the only problem that I have, and, and Dan, I've uh, sent you the menu from the catering department. Right. Um, the um, I have made some tentative selections for uh, the brunch. Uh, I, you need to. Tell me what you want for dinner. I mean, uh, we can come up with almost anything you want, and as fancy or as casual as you want. Well, it seems to me um, for the dinner for the board, uh, when we're assuming there may, might be as many as 25 people, considering the guests who uh, like to come to board meetings, um, it, it occurs <clears throat> to me, friends, see if you agree, that maybe we should leave it up to Pete and the catering service to arrange meals mm -hmm within the $20 price range and and rely on their judgment. I mean, every every meeting that I've gone to, I've taken potluck for the dinners and they've all, the meals, and they've always been very good, and I don't think Green Spring will be any different than that. So rather than try to, try to have individual menu selections, why don't we let Pete and the catering service um, sort of organize $20 meals for us yeah, I have no problem with that, but I do have a request, and that is if you have a problem with, I don't know, gluten or anything else, uh, you've got to let me know so I can arrange to have, or if you're a vegetarian, uh, you've got to let right. me know so I can make arrangements to uh, to furnish that, that need. Okay, well, anyone with special dietary needs, communicate that to Pete by email. But otherwise, we're going to let Pete and his catering service pick out $20 meals for us and uh, and rely on their good judgment. Sounds like a good plan. Let's go, that, let's go with Terrific. it. Terrific. Terrific. Okay. Now, um, uh, I've outlined in the uh, agenda the sort of order of procedure. We'll have our business meeting on Saturday and then a brief meeting to elect officers, as we have done in the past, on Sunday evening after the Sunday afternoon meeting has named the new directors. Um, I'll report on the present status of the nominating process. As you know, the, uh, the January uh, lifeline had the call for nominations as usual in it, and there's a deadline which will be February 6th, I, I believe I recall, and uh, there is a nominating committee as the bylaws provide, consisting of the presidents of um, uh, state associations, three presidents. Pete Straub is serving as chair. Walt Boyer is a member. And George Chiatis is a member of the nominating committee. And they George will receive Hill? George Chiatis, T-G-A-I-T-T-A-S. He's the president of the Pennsylvania yeah. Yeah. Uh, group. Yes. So, um, so they will be, uh, they will constitute a nominating committee. They will receive recommendations and they will be prepared to present these recommendations to the general membership meeting, which will take place on Sunday afternoon. Um, now, I, I have on item 3E, I just want to be clear, I just want to be sure we're all clear about the voting uh, sort of regimen that will take place in March, just so that there's no confusion on the site. Uh, you all have seen item 3E. I'm just wondering if there's anyone who is any different 
view of how the eligibility to vote should be seen uh, on at that time. I don't have any problem. Okay. Uh, I'll assume that that's uh, it's just quite consistent with past practice. I just wanted to be sure uh, that it was okay with everyone. Now, on item 3F, a tentative agenda for the general membership meeting, uh, I've attached what I've put in the lifeline as a tentative agenda. Bob has, I, I put membership issues. Bob has pointed out in a memo this morning that really we should have a membership report, especially since we have a rather good membership report to give at this meeting. So I propose that I, that we change the membership issues item to a membership report and that we ask Vice President in Charge of Membership, Bob Nicholson, to give the report. And I also would like to propose or, or suggest what Bob suggested, which is that we put uh, some of the upbeat things higher up on the agenda uh, and put the financial report somewhat lower uh, and uh, if people agree with that, I'll I'll just sort of reorganize the agenda that way. Now we have we have uh, suggestions for resource persons. First of all, let me say that I'm hoping we can wrap up the the uh, uh, the Bill of Rights project in the near future. Uh, we have had a lot of participation, a lot of feedback from around the country, people who have been discussing it. Uh, it's time to, it seems to me it's time to wrap it up. It seems to me that um, if, we, if we propose sort of a model bill of rights or a model set of principles, whatever we want to call it, that should be approved by the board after March. But at the March meeting, to the general membership, it would be good if we report back to them on the feedback. And one member of the Bill of Rights Committee, David Swain, is working on such a report. We report back to them on feedback and give the assembled gathering the members of the body chance to weigh in on the whole issue of the Bill of Rights, whether or not it's necessary, and what its provisions should include. And then the board, informed by that discussion at the March meeting, perhaps in April, will be prepared to approve a model Bill of Rights, just as we've approved a model set of laws, model laws. Uh, now, at the same time, people have proposed that in that afternoon meeting, we also include um, a kind of a talk, uh, informative, educational, and inspirational talk. Um, and there are three ideas. One is Steve Mag, one is Bill Brisk, and the third idea is one that I'd like to lay on the table, which again has to do with this uh, discussion of that Jack is going to talk to us about later in the meeting, whether that issue uh, might also be or might be might be one of the might be one thing that we would we would consider as the uh, sort of uh, educative and inspirational uh, item. Uh, you all have seen, uh, and let me ask this, Pete, when you uh, proposed Bill Brisk, did you circulate that proposal to the whole board or just to me? When I did what? When you proposed that we think of Bill Brisk as a resource person for the <clears throat> March meeting, did you propose that to me only or to the whole board? Oh, just sorry. to you, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I then I think... Uh, uh, Pete, would you mind describing Bill Brisk to us? Uh, the only thing I know about him is uh, information that was in uh, the email, I think, that I shared with you. Um, he, according to um, Catherine Pearson, uh, is uh, speaking to one of the groups that she heads, and is representing uh, the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys Educational Fund. Um, for many years, I was a member of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, and uh, I know them to be uh, quite uh, uh, <laughs> elder law oriented. And um, if he's going to represent them, uh, speaking to a group with Catherine Pearson, uh, that seemed to me to be uh, indicative of his uh, level of experience and, uh, and his capability. 
I've just uh, emailed to the board, to all of you, a uh, piece memo to me about Bill Brisk. Uh, and if you scroll down in that memo, you will see um, uh, at the bottom a memo from Jack Cumming, which uh, sort of describes uh, Bill Brisk uh, as a possible resource person. In fact, maybe I'll just read what's, uh, what uh, Jack Cumming quoted in his memo. Bill Brisk continues to practice elder law in Newton, Massachusetts. He teaches the subject at Suffolk Law School and devotes time to several organizations that support elder issues. He was hailed as Elder Law's Renaissance Man in the October-November issue of the NAELA News, which includes... That's the National Colorado Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. Thank you. NAELA. Uh, NAELA, which uh, included a cover photo of Bill and his wife, uh, etc. So uh, that's it. And then uh, higher on the... Uh, on the uh, sequence is an endorsement from uh, Catherine Pearson of uh, uh, mentioning that she's also employing him as a resource person for one of her uh, academic conferences. So he sounds like a highly qualified person if we want to invite him. At the same time, um, as you've seen, Bob Nicholson this morning reminded us that we had planned to invite Steve Mag to talk about changes in the CCRC industry we had thought he might do this in Nashville, but he had a daughter's wedding that that uh, got in the way, so to speak. And so uh, we could also uh, reissue the invitation to Steve Mag to do the same assignment for us in March in Greenspring. He only uh, lives about a mile from Greenspring, so it's, it's an easy thing for him to do. Uh, uh, that's uh, Steve Mag, did you say? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Walt Boyer, I had a couple comments. Um, yes, go one, ahead, Walt. Uh, one, if you let, let Steve Mag speak, he's a great speaker, um, but he will speak for maybe an hour and a half to two hours before you can and get, <laughs> yeah. shut him up. So give him a time frame. Right, yeah. that's right. Fifteen, twenty minutes. Yep. The other point I would make is um, if we're going to invite Bill um, brisk. Brisk. Uh, yeah, I would ask that we give him a topic such as the uh, current legislature uh, agenda in Congress and what it might mean for for adult, um, seniors. Right. Okay. Th this right. is Jack. Uh, it, it it seems to me it doesn't need to be an either or. Both Bill Brisk and Steve Mogg are attorneys working in the same area. They might collaborate on a joint discussion of these issues and bring varying <coughs> different perspectives to bear, which could make a very interesting interplay in the way they uh, approach the subject. Whether they collaborate, yeah, whether they collaborate with one another or speak individually, I think it's a good idea to have yeah, both I do of them. Too. Ruth and Ruth and I agree. In other words, we could make them a kind of panel. Yeah. yeah. Well, that there is advantage to that. This is Pete. Um, Stephen has spoken here uh, three or four times, and he generally uh, uses a PowerPoint presentation that is warmed over from speeches he's given around the country to uh, leading age groups. Um, and he's he's quite good in terms of uh, what the upcoming uh, and prospective uh, new residents need and want and uh, will stand for and so on. Uh, and uh, he's good at the big picture. Uh, much less so uh, dealing with laws, and that would be um, uh, Bill Bliss's uh, uh, strong suit. Well, why, I'm wondering. I'm wondering if maybe we could um, we could uh, assume that the first half of that afternoon meeting might be given over to an educative session, and we'd invite uh, Steve Mag and Bill Brisk, and we we'd, we'd expect the the session to last no longer than an hour and a half, including discussion from the floor, give each of them a half an hour, 
ask Steve to talk about the things that he is so adept at, as Pete has described, and ask Bill Brisk to address the question of legislation and the congressional agenda. It's a good idea. Yep, yep. Good thought. Does, uh, I don't know that Bill Brisk particularly is involved with federal legislation. Does, yeah, what, what, don't you want to have in the area of their expertise? Well, what would you suggest, Jack? Uh, uh, let's see, he, he's... He's a well, Renaissance man in elder law. Well, yeah. I would, I would, su- uh, I would suggest that uh, Pete Alb has an elder law background, uh, as does Catherine Pearson. We could just ask either Pete or Catherine uh, if they'd be willing to uh, put a program together using these two two uh, associates of theirs. They're both. They're all in the same profession. And uh, they would know what would make more sense. I like the idea of an educated session rather than just having him uh, announce what uh, leading age's current legislative yep. agenda is. Well, this is Pete. I mean, I can certainly get a hold of uh, Catherine and uh, find out, uh, uh, you know, her suggestions and have her talk with uh, Bill and see what he can come up with. Uh, uh, talk with Bill and Steve. I mean, yeah, okay. That's not a problem. Yeah, cause I okay, think well. That's a role uh, to play. So he's, he's there representing a client, which is a little different from what Bill Brisk would be doing. Well, yes and no. Um, when Stephen has talked to us, um, he talks about uh, CCRCs in general and um, the kinds of requirements that the new prospective residents are going to want and have and how best the, uh, the CCRCs can solve those. Now, that's obviously an area of great interest to management, but it... Um, uh, it was very interesting for us, but, you know, nothing that we can do anything about. Uh, I guess what I'm uh, – uh, Pete, let me just be frank. I'm just hoping that we're not uh, throwing too much at you to do. In other words, you're going to be working on the transportation issue. Uh, you're going to be working on the food issue. He could delegate uh, some of that, you know. Uh, I'm okay. sorry, say that again. I said you could delegate some of that. Yeah, that's you, you fine. Maybe, uh, okay. So, so uh, Pete, as long as you feel okay and not overwhelmed, uh, I, I'd like to suggest that we follow the suggestion that you work with Catherine at uh, uh, sort of defining a focus for uh, the way these two resource persons might uh, interact with each other or, or make a program together or seriatim or somehow. I'll just be sure that that the program remains within some bounds so that we have time for the rest of the important agenda. And I'm suggesting that if that an hour and a half would be the outside maximum, including questions and discussion from the floor. What time would problems. you like it to start? Uh, 2 p.m. 2 p.m. to 3.30. 2 to 3.30. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, is that agreeable to everyone? We haven't taken any motions on all this, but I think we understand like each other. This is good. Okay, good. So, uh, so I think, unless anyone has any other thoughts, we have our work done for this meeting at least. We'll have to discuss this again in February. But for this meeting at least, we have our work done on plans for the March annual meeting. And we're very grateful to Pete Straub, who's a resident of the host uh, community for all that he's doing to make this go well. Thank you so Is much. Is there any request or wish for uh, food on Sunday? Uh, let me see. Well, on Sunday, uh, yes. And on Sunday, we're going to have to wait until we hear from all the people who will be coming from elsewhere, the general membership, before we know how many guests we're going to have on Sunday. So that will all be, uh, we've given a March 6th deadline for people to let us know if they want food on Sunday. And at that time also, Pete, 
you will pick out $20 meals, and that's, that's what people will have paid, uh, which will include both anyone who signed up for meals and their registration forms, plus board members who are staying, uh, who will, will be staying for that meeting. So we'll get those numbers to you by March 6th. Okay, and, and Greenspring will furnish uh, snacks and uh, drinks during the meetings. Okay. That would be great. Yeah, Will they want to charge us for that? No. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Before we leave this. Oh, go ahead. I have one question for Pete, and that is transportation from the motels to Greenspring. Is that a problem? Uh, I can't answer that. And and the reason is that uh, uh, they all, the motels, are well aware of Greenspring, and many of them, and I think I put that on the list that I sent to you, Dan, uh, many of them have uh, shuttle service back and forth to the metro, and uh, if there are, uh, you know, six or seven people in the motel, uh, I would imagine the hotel can, uh, or the motel can uh, arrange for shuttle service to Greenspring. Okay, Uh, the reason I asked there was a problem in... uh uh, our last meeting, uh, the distance was too short for taxis, and if uh, a ride wasn't arranged, I think it was Jack Matheson who was stranded at the motel. Are, were you in, are you talking about Houston? No, or, or no. Dallas? Nashville. No. Uh, Mystic, Mystic, Connecticut. Mystic. But, uh-huh. Judy. Yeah, it was but, a Mystic. Yeah. Well, I'll, no, I'll, I'll do what I can, but again, um, uh, Dan, didn't that, on that list that I sent you, didn't that include that there were shuttles in some of them and not all of them? Yes. So I think what we should, what I should do is I'll dig out that list and circulate it to the whole board so that you can make your selections of hotels based on the, uh, the hotel's uh, transportation service. Yeah, and, and they're all within a mile or two of Greenspring. Yeah, but I can't walk a mile. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I can either. <laughs> uh, Are there I think it would be a nice idea if you selected uh, one or two motels so we all stayed at the same place yeah. instead of board members scattered at ten different motels. Okay, so why don't Pete and I consult offline about uh, which motel, which two motels might be the most optimal in terms of transportation, service, and proximity to green screen. Okay, if we do that, then I can go by the hotels and say, look, (laughs) you're going to have X number of people here, and they're going to want to go to either uh, Green Spring or the Metro. And we work that out, and I'm sure that we can. Another question Uh is, are there any guest accommodations right at Green, Green Spring? Yes, sir. I don't know whether they're available, but uh, well, uh, I can check that on that out. if you wish. For, particularly, if, like for Judy, if she had her place right there. If oh, you can find that out, that would be very advantageous for her. We have um, either two or three uh, units that are uh, uh, rentable. Good. Well, maybe maybe it makes sense. To, uh, to to put to reserve them, Pete, because we we'll, we certainly will be able to fill them with okay. uh, board members or resource persons or somebody. Absolutely. So so I think if they're available, whatever is available, we should reserve, and we'll be sure to use it. I'll check on that tomorrow and uh, let you know by email, Dan, and uh, uh, how many are available and, and so on. The price, as I recall, is $91 a, a day, but uh, I'm not sure if that's accurate or not anymore. I oh, haven't used it. Certainly, it's, 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 certainly uh, I'm, sure, I'm, sure it's comp- I'm sure it's competitive with any motel price, so that yeah. would be better. It'd probably be better rate because if they did us here – Stone Ridge, and that you didn't have to pay any tax or tip or anything else. So, you know, yep. see right. the best price you can get. Okay. Right. Did I hear someone else trying to say something? Uh, okay. Uh, good. Okay. Are we ready to move on to item four? NACRA board meetings by a video conference. Uh, 
Uh, I've gotten, uh, I've been in touch with Bennett about this. He's ready to uh, orient us to this whole process. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the, and uh, but Jack has had the suggestion, which I think is a good one, that he and I, and perhaps uh, any other board member who feels technologically uh, sort of uh, curious, uh, might uh, try to set up first and see what experience we have, and then be better able to let the rest of you know what exactly is involved. So, uh, if that, rather than try to set up a time when all you know seven or eight of us are sort of experimentally and fiddling with this, uh, maybe just Jack and I and anyone else who really wants to join us will uh, will plan to set this up among ourselves and then know better how to advise the rest of you how to get into the act. Okay. Does that seem like a reasonable way forward? Yep. Yes. yes. If, you would, uh, if you would advise. Like... Well, uh, Judy? If Judy, you advise you... that if you advise us at the March meeting in person, uh I think it would be better. Good. We'll be, we'll after be after sure to be you and Jack figure it all out. Right. If you tell us in person, we can ask questions there, which is much better than emailing. Mm-hmm. Good. We'll try to do that. Uh, I would uh, I'd like, I'd appreciate well, joining you if, if it's possible because I'm interested in this. Thank okay. You. So we'll add Walt to the experimental group. Terrific. This is Jack. I just want to add one quick aside. I first uh, met Judy Moss on a video conference with uh, providers. The providers were having difficulty with it, but Judy and I were both visible on the video, and uh, it worked very well. We used WebEx, didn't we, Judy? It worked very well, except my phone got disconnected somewhere in the middle. Okay. And, uh, and Bennett is recommending something called gotomeeting.com, which I don't think is the same as WebEx, so we'll, we'll have to figure it, it out. They're, they're all very similar. They all, they all use the same technology. It's all the same. They, it, it's all on uh, Cisco systems. Okay, great. Uh, are we ready to move on to item five, the new method of state chapter organization? Uh, at our last meeting, we discussed this, uh, and we concluded that I should set up a small meeting, a small committee of three or four to uh, examine the the issue. Um, and um, I uh, spoke to, uh, I, I invited three people, and uh, I've heard only from two of them so far, um, and one of them uh, has sort of, uh, would like a chance to propose an alternative strategy, and that's Judy Moss, and I wonder, Judy, if you would mind uh, telling the board what you suggested to me. Yeah, uh as you may recall, I voted against the motion at the last meeting because I think it is only part of our problem. I think the um, bylaws committee needs to look at the whole thing and not do it piecemeal that the uh, 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 brief discussion on membership is only part of the organization, the structure of NACRA, and we cannot go uh, modifying the bylaws every other meeting or every other year. The bylaws have to be a concise thing that we can all live with for five or ten years. So I'm suggesting that adding to uh, the people that Dan has already invited to the membership committee Adding that, uh, myself and Bill Straub and doing, having a meeting the Friday before the conference where we can meet in person and hash out uh, a lot of these problems. We cannot do it piecemeal. So um, my motion is then to uh, combine the membership committee with the bylaws committee and meet a day earlier 
in uh, Greenspring. The, if that's I, a motion, I, I will uh, second it, Mr. Jean. If that's a motion, I will second it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I might just mention uh, for the for the board's information that uh, the three people uh, Judy's referring to is I invited Judy, uh, I invited uh, Jack Cumming, and I invited Bob Nicholson to join this membership committee. Uh, Bob Nicholson obviously has a huge amount of experience and knowledge about membership issues. Uh, Jack Cumming uh, also does. And even though it might have been a little inconsistent for me to have asked Judy since she voted against the motion, I felt that since the vote was close and we're anxious to keep the bylaw committee and the membership issues committee in sync, I thought it was important to have Judy as chair of the bylaws committee included. Uh, so anyway, we have a motion and we have a second. Is there any discussion? Could I just ask a question, Ms. Ruth? The, the Judy Jack coming and and Bob Nicholson would be part of the what? The membership committee or the combined bylaws membership? Well, Judy is proposing the motion is that for the next meeting of the bylaws committee. We schedule it for the Friday before yeah, the that. March meeting, and that that the mem the people I've invited on the membership committee be added for that meeting to the bylaws committee, so that we can discuss it all together. They're not they added to the bylaws committee; they're added to that meeting. There's that. I meeting. think that was right. the point that was being yeah, raised. Right. And then, then who is, who is now the bylaws committee? Who are they? Judy, they are Judy Moss, Judy and, uh, and Pete Straub and Dan Seeger. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other questions of information or discussion about the motion? Yeah, this is Pete. Um, I need to make arrangements. What time would you like the room? And uh, want snacks and things there at the same time? Uh, are you going to want to have dinner Friday night also? Well, uh, Pete, that's, those are good questions. Why don't we see first if the motion passes, and if it does, then we'll discuss those details. All right, that's fine. Any other discussion about the motion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Good, the motion carries. Uh, Pete, I suggest, and see if it's agreeable to the other people involved, that we plan to meet on Friday uh, at, at uh, uh, say, 1.30. No. Uh, what about 10 o'clock? Oh, you? Oh, okay. Uh, I have to come in. I have to come in the day before for a 3.30 meeting, so I'm here for 10 o'clock. Oh, okay. That'll be better. Uh, why don't we meet for 10 o'clock, which Pete... Uh, it means that that the uh, five of us, I guess there are five of us, will will need lunch and supper. Okay. Uh, let's let's continue with the twenty dollar uh, figure. Uh, yes. For those five, and uh, what I may do is uh, just take the whole group to one of the dining rooms rather than try and set up through catering. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. That sounds fine. That's good. Um, okay. Now, uh, we do, uh, it is, uh, we, we've been working for 45 minutes. Thank you very much, everyone, for an expeditious meeting. And I'd like to turn now for our last bit of information uh, to Jack Cumming uh, to, to brief us just a little bit about the, the import and significance of the discussion he has been involved with with other people about possible changes in FASB rules. Uh, Jack, do you want to take that over? Uh, sure. In what rules? Excuse me, I didn't understand. What uh, rules? I'll explain. All right. Um, and uh, first I should say that I, I don't know that it's completely broken that I'm doing it, but I'll do it anyway. But Gerard Highland chairs the financial soundness committee, and he's the one who's been most active in working on this. Uh, the term that Dan used was FASB, which stands for Financial Accounting Standards Board. It's a, I believe, seven or eight person board that legislates the codifications 
that are the laws that govern accounting. Uh, they're not laws in the sense of being, um, well, they are enforced by the state through the SEC. The SEC supports those laws. Um, Bill Root is the one who's been most uh, active in this area. If I'm not mistaken, I think I saw this morning that he may have written 14 times to the FASB lobbying on behalf of positions that he thought were important. So that's the background that gave rise to this, and it's been a conversation primarily among Gerard and Bill Root. I've been involved, and a couple of other people, Bill, a fellow named Bill Ratcliffe uh, from Maryland was involved. Um, the, it relates to changes which are taking place in accounting. Since accounting is, it started out being principled, and the principle for accounting was that accounting should reflect the commitments that an organization makes and the results that it gets from meeting those commitments. In other words, if you have a business, you offer a product or a service, and the accounting, and you charge for it, the accounting records how well you're doing, and that led to a principled approach to accounting. But uh, the SEC wanted to have more rules to ensure uniformity and consistency, and the accounting profession adopted rules. The SEC is primarily concerned with uh, traded security in the equity markets, and the result is that nonprofits were not of great interest, although they fell within the umbrella of uh, the accounting. And so it was that in the early 1990s, the CCRC industry, principally through leading aid, but also led by Kendall Corporation, lobbied to have certain accounting rules specified that were specifically for CCRCs and favored certain interests. Now the accounting leadership has come under criticism because those rules uh, were not were pointed in one direction, and they're trying to restore a more principled approach to CCRC accounting, where CCRCs would be subject to the same accounting standards as apply to other industries. So that's the gist of it. I'll give you one example. If you put money in a bank, you expect that the money will be there when you request it <coughs> in a deposit, and you believe that the bank owes you the full amount. The refund contracts are, in a sense, a deposit made with the provider and subject to withdrawal when the resident leaves the facility, subject to the unit being sold to a successor. So you would expect that that money would be available to meet it. That has not been what the industry has done. The industry has spent that money, even though it was subject to demand, and that has caused some tension in some communities and has led to a number of bankruptcies. Right. So, so the uh, accountants now are requiring that those that accounting be strengthened to reflect the true underlying fundamentals. The goal is to have accounting reflect the truth of the matter, not what somebody might want. Now, there is a difference between leading age and NACRA on this, since Residents want assurance that promises made will be promises kept. Right. So residents want financial strength. They don't want to go through what Jennifer Young is going through with bankruptcy. The providers, however, want growth and want to be shielded from having to go into equity markets because as nonprofits, they can't raise capital in the equity markets. So they want to be able to bootstrap their communities based on debt and entry fee funding, and that has led to a number of these being undercapitalized, and that's a matter of controversy. So these two views are in tension, and that's what's um, leading to a dialogue uh, within the Financial uh, Soundness Committee, which I believe is sort of 
in process of being reformed. Uh, Bill Root has since moved from from um, Bill Root, who's been the main proponent of all this all along, has now moved from Maryland to I think Michigan. Has but he, really? he seems to still want to be involved. Hmm. Uh, Jack is is the FASB change just under discussion, or has it been decided, and is it inevitable? There are some changes which have been enacted, and they go, they're go they going into effect. For example, uh, Asbury Methodist has booked refund liability. The Erickson communities have not yet booked it, but will be required to book it by the end of the year. So, the, so by the end of 2015, all CCRCs will be required to book their refund liabilities. Well, unless make it that it, it, it they they don't have to if it's limited to the amount of the proceeds from the continuing. For example, if uh, if a if an organization sold uh, your it, it has to be specific to the unit and specific to the proceeds for that unit. So, if you had a refund contract for your unit, they resold the unit successor who chose not to have a refund contract, and so they paid much less, you, your refund would then be reduced because the successor chose to have a non-refund contract instead of a refund. So so the effect of that out has been that most providers are choosing to book the whole whole amount. I mean, this gets it, you get, it gets as convoluted as some crazy laws, uh, and uh, that the example you shows how convoluted it can get. It has nothing to do with anything that makes sense or, or is yes. fair. Let me ask a question. Uh, you talked about banks, uh, the guarantee. That's why when we deposit, we have FDIC insurance. Are you suggesting that we then have some kind of federal control over <laughs> CCRCs? Uh, no, not at all. We in, among our model laws, as I'm sure you know, we have a guarantee law that's fashioned after the insurance model, which is a state model, which they, they prefer and has worked more effectively than the banking model. The bank, I'm sure you know that the FDIC has fallen into controversy and had a lot of problems, and that has been avoided on using the Oh, maybe we bored him. <laughs> I don't see how. Well, the, the reason the reason I thought it might be useful to have this discussion, Jack, is that I picked up from the convers from the correspondence that I've been getting CCs of that there is some uh, worry that the change that the modest changes in the rules in the direction of more accountability might cause stress in significant numbers of CCRCs and they might even go bankrupt as a result of the new practice. And I no. thought, if, if that is true, that's really alarming. Uh, yeah, that that's not entirely true. Okay, uh, good. Because bankruptcy occurs when you no longer have the cash to meet your obligations. If you're if you sell an entry fee to somebody and he's thinking you're going to give get benefits over the remainder of his lifetime, but use the cash that he just gave you, he just sold his house, he gave you cash, and you use it to meet your debt covenant, you're you're still solvent even though that man's future has just been thrown away. So there will be widespread impairments but there will not necessarily be bankruptcies because residents have no standing to demand that uh, that their their the commitments made to them be assured. Right. Okay. And so we do have a strong interest in the matter, but I don't think it'll lead to bankruptcy. However, if if the regulators start stepping up and really regulating, it'll lead to reorganization because if a if a if a CCRC has liabilities greater than its assets, 
that means it's made promises that are more than it's, ab- it's the money that it has to meet them. Now, it can make that up by overcharging future people. So it can overcharge in the future and make up the deficit, but it's already in a hole. And uh, right. there's, there's a number of them that are in that position. And when that occurs, we certainly have a concern that that might create inequities in the whole thing and that, that it's an undesirable result. I think what it may do is force uh, some reorganizations because they're going to need to get access to the equity markets. That's the only way for them to get the capitalization that they require. Okay. Well, thank you, Jack. I appreciate your being willing to give us this orientation on an impromptu basis. I just really asked Jack to do this this morning, so we really appreciate it, and we'll be following the discussion (laughs) with a lot of interest. I wonder before we close if there is any if there are any questions for Jack about what he has just told us. Okay. Well, thank you uh, everyone. Uh we'll uh I think we're ready to adjourn the meeting. Is there a motion that we should adjourn? I so move, Jean Hurley. Thank you, Jean. Is there a second? Is there a second to uh, to the motion that we adjourn? Walt Boyer, second. Thank you, Walt. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you, friends. We'll uh, be back on the phone with each other uh, a month from now. Thank you very much. And, Dan, you're going to get together with me at some point. Yes. The following yes. participant has left the conference. Jane Hurley. The following participant has left the conference. Walton Boyer. The following participant has left the conference. Dan Seeger. The following participant has left the conference. Ruth Walsh. The following the participant follow- has left the conference. Judy Moss. The following participant has left the conference. Peace, Rob.